Eric and Matt got a hold of me a few weeks ago and asked me what I wanted to talk about and if I could give them a job title or a talk title, so I did. Um, and then I changed my mind and decided I wanted to talk about something else. So what I'm going to talk about today is what I call the rationalization of hiring, algorithms, intermediaries, and information. And I'll probably at some point circle around to the other talk I was going to give because it kind of you know, intersect in some interesting ways, what I think are interesting ways. So I'll, I'll try to get to that again. Um, yeah, let me just say too, if you've got questions or comments or anything, don't wait till the end. If you want to ask questions or, or just sort of challenge me about things or have me clarify things or whatever, that's, that's certainly fine. Um, I also, if you haven't noticed already, I talk really, really fast sometimes, so it's okay to ask me to slow down. You know, I don't mind that really. Where I sort of take off of this paper, some changes that I think of, or the soon to be paper, I hope. Some changes have been taking place in the labor markets over the last few years. And I, I think the first thing we're seeing, and people are talking about this more and more, is sort of the demise or even the decline of internal labor markets. If you look at sort of what happened post-World War II up until really the 1980s, the way we thought about the employment relationship and the way we thought about how careers developed were in terms of what we call internal labor markets. And what these are are sort of you know, systems of career progression where people come into organizations at, at a certain level. There's a set of procedures and a set of mechanisms by which they move up the ladder. Um, you know, sort of on-the-job training that prepares them for one step to the next. Um, and this is, you know, it, it's taught, called internal, which means source, or it sort of suggests internal to a particular company, but could also be internal within an occupation. So plumbers would be an internal labor market, even though they change employers, the sorts of things. Um, what's happened over the last, you know, 25, 30 years is really the, the dismantling of internal labor markets. What we're seeing now is more and more kind of what you might think of as open rather than closed rela employment relationships. Um, more sort of, you know, situations in which people don't have that kind of regularized career line. One of the major parts of this is the hiring is increasingly from the outside or positions are increasingly filled from the outside of companies as opposed to promotions within a company. Okay, and this has been substantial really and I think it's kind of gone unnoticed by a lot of labor market sociologists. Um, some estimates I've seen is that employers in the United States in the 1980s, or from World War II to the 1980s, filled about 10% of vacancies from the outside. Now they fill up to about 60% of vacancies from the outside. So that's a big shift in just you know, how employers are bringing people into companies. Now a lot of these dat data are, I'll admit, sort of squ squishy because you don't really know, a lot of it sort of pertains more to large companies and certain you know, parts that more sort of you know, different kinds of labor. But the trends are there. I think for the most part, you are seeing more and more hiring is external hiring. Um, you're also seeing a shift in which a lot more jobs aren't what you might think of as, as employer jobs. Okay, there's not so much jobs that are tied to a particular company or a particular employer, but they're more sort of, you know, outsourced, contingent, you know, short-term sorts of things. Okay, the bigger part of the labor market is sort of doesn't involve that, that long-term relationship between employers and individuals. Um, Along with all that, and sort of accompanying all that, are a couple of major trends I think that are taking place in the labor market. And a lot, of, a lot of what I'm talking about today is stuff that's sort of beginning to take place and is still on the horizon in many cases, but I think the trends are sort of clear that you know, we are going in many ways you know, a particular direction. First, and I sort of collectively call these the rationalization of hiring, all right? Um, first piece of that is what you might think of as the digitalization of the hiring process. More and more hiring takes place online. More and more in all aspects of hiring. You know, more and more of job matching or whatever is an electronic transmission. It's an electronic transaction in some way. Um, all sorts of terms to apply, for, to apply to this. Big data, analytics, workforce science, robotic recruitment, people ops. A whole series of things that kind of you know, pertain to how the human relations or human resources function in organizations has been shifting. Um, Along with that, sort of these big, you know, two sort of large trends, digitization and also labor market intermediation. You know, sort of the increasing presence of a whole field of labor market intermediaries that kind of come together between demand and supply, that come together between job seekers and employers. Um, and that's always been the case to some degree. We've always had job fairs, we've always had sort of you know, headhunters or these sorts of things. But I think just the extent to which it permeates pretty much every aspect of the labor market is a new thing, okay? And it's not only a new thing, it's an emerging thing. It's much larger than it was you know, a generation ago. Eric. As you're working through this, I'm thinking this is really from a very employer perspective. Should I be thinking about this as an employer-driven process or just as a descriptive thing? Um, it's 
I'm going to try to talk about it from both sides here, both employers and employees, I think the, or job seekers, because I think the biggest implications really are on the supply side in many ways, okay? So, yeah, but that's a good question. I'll try to, if I don't get to that, you know. Um, so sort of the, you know, the punchline here, I guess, in some ways, is that hiring now has kind of become a relationship, or is, and what I say is becoming, I'll say, and continues to become, or is going that direction, a relationship not principally between an employer and a job seeker, but rather a relationship shaped and even made by an algorithm. And I'll have a lot to say about algorithms today. Um, and an algorithm, you know, simply is a set of automated decision rules that augment or even replace human decision making. And as the locus of hiring shifts away from a specific manager, the agency of the demand side shifts from the human to the machine. And that's all sort of black mirror stuff, right? I mean, it sounds a little science fiction-y, but I think those trends really are kind of taking place. And I'm, you know, I hope to kind of demonstrate that as I go through this. Um, an example, this is from a company from their webpage called First, the name of the company was First Job. I think they've recently changed it to something, you know, equally post-industrial here. Um, but what they've got is something they call Maya, which is, they characterize as a robot recruiter. Um, and I don't know if I'll go to that web page or not, but maybe, it, you know, if you want that, you can share. It's a YouTube video that kind of shows how this thing works. And it's really, it's really chilling, because you really do feel like you're talking to somebody on the other end. It's better than, you know, what AT&T does when your phone doesn't work, okay? Um, Maya, and this, this is from their web page directly. Maya, for my assistant, has all the capabilities of a recruiter, juggling applicant screening and first round interviews. The design is based on close mirroring of human language concerns and characteristics. Maya is able to ask and field questions, process answers and filter quality applications or applicants through a series of prescribed stipulations and factors. She'll even wish you a great first day at work, which she does. I mean, it's really worth going to the, to the site here. Um, goes on to say, this is still from the company webpage. The technology saves recruiters time, sifting through resumes and phone screenings, and automatically moves the most promising applicants to the top of the pile. It doesn't really tell you how this takes place. It doesn't tell you what sort of the, the underlying you know, indicator is, but people get moved up and down here. Um, it also responds to applicants it deems unfit to move forward. Um, now, notice the, the little sleight of hand that's taking place here, where it says it deems. In other words, there's some agency kind of being given to the algorithm, which is sort of interesting. Um, a refreshing shift for applicants used to being ghosted by applicant application portals. There's another shift there too about how what they're arguing here is this is really in the employee's interest. This is the job seeker's interest that this sort of thing take place. Even though they're really being, you know, this stuff is being marketed to employers, obviously. Um, continue a bit more with this. Um, indeed, perhaps most appealing about the technology is its ability to provide a comfortable, seamless experience for applicants. So again, this is, this is a good thing for the person who's trying to find a job, right? The chatbot is able to steer the interview based on the responses of the applicants. In fact, 72% of recently surveyed applicants reported forgetting that they're even interviewing with a chatbot at all, which is, you know, pretty interesting, okay? Um, it, 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 yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, if Maya thinks, and there's a clever little phrase too, okay, if Maya thinks, all right? I mean, again, this is a, a software code, right? Um, if Maya thinks the applicant is a good fit, she'll schedule an interview for them with the actual hiring manager. She'll even provide directions to, for how to get there and pointers on how to dress and suggest other opportunities to candidates that might be better fit for their background. So this, I mean, you can really see this as sort of a, you know, an all-encompassing sort of approach to the whole human resources function. Okay, it's a really different thing we've seen here. Now the irony, I think, here too is, is that, you notice it goes through all this sort of digital stuff and then directs you to an interview. Okay, so the next step is to go to an interview with a manager. Now the interesting thing about that is interviews, managerial interviews have no predictive ability whatsoever to predict job performance. Okay, and which is interesting because every manager in the world considers himself or herself a great, skilled, insightful interviewer, and they're not. There's, not, there's every indication, and I'll talk about this quite a bit as I go through, that these algorithmically you know, generated indexes are better predictors of job performance than interviews are. Okay? Um, and what I say there too is if you ever, the best example I can give of this is if you look at the New York Times Sunday business section, Okay, not every week, but the, every other week on the second page inside, they always do an interview with an, some entrepreneur or another. 
And those things have a certain arc to them, okay? There's, the, the first part is always like, you know, I learned a good work ethic from my parents. And then the second part is, you know, company culture really matters. And then the third part is they give you these little insights into how they interview people and what questions they ask and how they all think they sort of got, you know, the insight, you know, like, you know, what kind of an animal would you be and why, okay? Um, and they're all full of it. I mean, those, there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that what they do, other than being sort of good stories about themselves, has any effect at you know, hiring better workers at all. Um, but everybody believes, or they believe it, I think, and people in general, I mean, interviewers believe it. Okay, um, continuing though, you know, so getting past Maya is difficult. You know, people have their application out there, you know, getting beyond Maya is a tough thing to do, but even getting to Maya can be difficult. Okay, because there's another series of labor market intermediaries, another series of you know, applications and chatbots and everything else. And what they do, they don't allow you to even talk to Maya or Maya's sisters um, until you complete some challenges. Okay, they might, there's companies like Hacker Rank and Code Fights that require candidates to demonstrate coding competencies and challenges before they're invited to apply for a job. So they have to sort of pass this certain test, then they go deal with Maya, and then they get an interview, okay? So it's a whole different set of processes for hiring than we're used to seeing, I think. Um, you also got companies like, I guess you call that SCORE and NAC, who partner with employers in a range of industries to create custom challenges to serve as gates at the top of the hiring funnel. Okay, um, so the question I'm sure you're thinking about, you know, is, is this real, okay? Is this stuff really happening? Is this widespread? And I think, in fact, it is. I mean, there's no really good estimates of how much of this is taking place. And you know, you certainly you can think of people who've gotten jobs in other ways. And you can imagine you know, more traditional hiring. But there is a lot of indication that this is a very strongly emerging direction, that more and more hiring decisions are made based on these sorts of you know, digitalized, rationalized interactions. Um, most hiring now, well over 80% involves the internet in one way or another. Either the application comes through the internet or, or you know, jobs are posted online or whatever. You know, most, most hiring activity is to some degree digitized. A number that just absolutely shocked me is you know, 2015, 28% of American job seekers use their smartphone to look for work. Um, who knew, you know? Um, labor market intermediaries too, and again, this is something I'll be talking about more and more, are everywhere. Um, and there are labor market intermediaries that are arising now in response to what other labor market intermediaries are doing, okay? I mean, it's sort of this arms race that I'll, I'll try to describe for you a bit. Um, in fact, it seems to me that it sort of changes the nature of the whole thing to the, to the point where even the concept of applying for a job has become sort of quaint. I mean, it's not so much you go and fill out an application and turn it into an employer and see what happens, but basically you, you, know, you sort of put your portfolio online. You, you kind of do what you're gonna do and put it out there and then you hit enter and you've applied for a thousand jobs. Okay, I mean, it's a really a very different sort of interaction that's taking place. Um, Are you literally entering to apply for multiple jobs? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you go to LinkedIn or something. You put your, you know, your your portfolio on LinkedIn, and whatever opens up. Okay. Um, Starbucks gets like, and this is again, it's hard to say because you don't know quite what an application is in the same way that maybe we did when you could count the number of resumes. But conservatively, Starbucks probably gets 120 applications for every opening. All right, and these are you know very entry level positions in many cases. Um, people in the personnel industry, you know, human resources types talk more and more about passive candidates, people that are sort of not doing anything actively to be looking for work, but their materials are out there, they're online. So in a sense, they are kind of you know, engaged in job search. Um, one of my favorites from a, a study of this stuff comes from Asa Denton, who's a 31-year-old software programmer in Reno, Nevada, who says, I kind of wonder if some of the jobs I'm applying to even exist. And there's more of that. I mean, there's sort of this ghost between what jobs are out there and what sort of, peop what sort of you know, applications are taking place. Um, so I think we do know something about, you know, the ex growing extent of algorithmic hiring, the algorithms in the labor market. I think we know a lot less about the, the extent to which they've actually penetrated selection decisions. You know, to what extent do algorithms and sort of algorithmically generated indices actually penetrate what takes place, who gets hired and who doesn't. Um, but we do know that there are certainly cases in which they matter. Okay, that people do get sorted, people do get selected in many cases on the basis of, you know, it, whether it's an you know, a algorithmically generated number or maybe it's something, you know, green, yellow, red, okay? People get sorted in ways that you know, direct them toward jobs or not direct them toward jobs. Um, 
given that though, we don't know quite what it is being signaled. Okay, so these algorithms do their thing, and they produce numbers, they produce indices, they produce people into categories, but nobody really is clear about what those numbers indicate, what they mean, what skills do they signal, what kind of competencies do they signal. Nobody knows. And we're not gonna find out, too, because these are things are very proprietal. I mean, you don't, you, companies have an interest in sort of keeping the, the black box of the algorithm secret, all right? Um, but again, they do make a difference. You have a very nice study by Barack and a couple other economists, or actually economists and a couple sociologists, um, report this, that dramatically being algorithmically recommended, and by recommended, they basically mean you're put in the green category as opposed to yellow or red category, increases the job applicants, unconditional likelihood of being hired, over applicants of observationally similar quality by about 50%. Now that's a lot. I mean, you're taking people that you match on every characteristic you can think of. Same education, same recommendations, same you know, work experience, everything else. But getting past the algorithm basically adds a 50% likelihood of your chance of being hired. I mean, that to me is a pretty substantial, I mean, I don't know what anything else will give you a kick like that. Um, and again, and most of that increase is because of just, you know, the fact that the algorithm pushes them to the next step of the, of the process. Now again, it's hard to say precisely what this means because these aren't, this particular study is not employer jobs. Okay, these aren't jobs that are sort of assigned to somebody in a long-term relationship with a particular company. But these are some of these short-term sorts of things, you know, little coding jobs or little, you know, design jobs or things like that, that kind of come and go. Um, so it's not clear that the same sort of thing would apply to long ter longer term, anyway, commitments with a given employer. Um, we also know, I think, that some of the aspirations that people who are producing these algorithms have for rationalized hiring are what I might characterize as a little creepy. Okay, that there really is sort of a, what well, looks like sort of a sinister thing going on here in some ways. Um, this is from a couple, Shamaro Music and his colleagues are, are human resources types, okay, the personnel psychologists who I think are actually involved in, in the production of these sorts of things. They've got you know, a startup of their own. But what they say is one of the most promising innovations for evaluating work-related talent is the deployment of machine learning algorithms for translating a person's digital records, such as their social media footprint, into a psychological profile, you know, personality, cognitive ability, and values. So in other words, there are algorithms that will go and take a look at what you've been doing on Facebook, what you've been doing on you know, Snapchat, and all these other things, and put those into, particularly, you know the, the big five psychological categories that people talk about? You know, it's whatever, narcissism and all those sorts of things. Basically put people into those five categories, feed this to employers, and they do, in fact, sort people based on this. So, I mean, you, you, you know, we often tell kids now, watch what you put on Facebook because, you know, it's going to have these effects. It's not just that you're putting up, you know, pictures of you doing a bong that can get you in trouble, but basically your whole Facebook profile can sort of lead to certain kinds of psychological profiles that have consequences. Okay? Um, another one that I thought was kind of interesting, too, that I'll put out here for you. The Royal Bank of Scotland uses brain scanning technology to help fill top graduate positions. Um, the tests let students know which jobs at the bank they would enjoy most. So they, they do brain scans on job applicants, run all that stuff through an algorithm, and decide, well, this is the kind of place, position you should have. This is where you should work. And they're, they're actually doing this. This is not science fiction. Okay, this stuff really is taking place. Okay, so why does all this stuff matter to labor market sociologists? Okay, why should we be thinking about these kind of thing? Well, you know, it strikes me as, you know, kind of important. Um, I think rationalization, by, again, rationalization, I'm talking about this whole process of you know, removing humans from the process and digitalizing it and sort of making it more, you know, not predictable, but more sort of, you know, again, rationalized in some way, more bureaucratic. It both solves and creates informational problems of trust. And I think I'm getting to Eric's question here soon. Um, visible credentials advantage job seekers. Okay, if you're looking for work and you can show this credential, if you can show this skill, if you can show this badge, whatever, that's to your advantage, okay, if you can do that. What we're finding though is as job seekers have to compete, increasingly compete for jobs from the outside, they lose the opportunity to have organizational gatekeepers directly observing those characteristics. Okay, so they haven't been in the, you know, they're trying to, to get to a job now, you're coming in from the outside rather than moving up. So people haven't directly observed your your abilities, your, your, your talents, your performance, things like that. Employers too now increasingly have to find ways to secure information that they trust and can fill openings when they can't rely on first-hand observation. 
Okay, so employers, like job seekers, have to find ways to get information when they don't have direct observation. Now, it's a problem, but it seems to me it's a bigger problem for job seekers than it is for employers. Okay, in terms of sort of labor market matching and you know, who's advantaged and who's disadvantaged, I think there's more at stake there in many ways for job seekers than for employers. Um, employers at this point are, have more information at their fingertips than they've ever had before. Okay, because you know, big data and all the stuff that's out there, there's much, much more information available to employers than has ever been the case, even though they don't really know what it means. Okay, it may be a score that puts you into, you know, bluebirds, yellowbirds, redbirds categories, okay? It may be sort of this algorithmically designed index, but there's more information out there even though the meaning of that information is kind of opaque, all right? Um, job seekers, on the other hand now, I think are increasingly in a position where they're unsure about what signals are being sought. You, know, you don't know what it is that the algorithm wants necessarily. Um, and if you don't know what signal is being sought, it's increasingly difficult to know how to send the signal you want to send. All right. Um, and again, individuals at the point of application for a job may or may not be aware of the role of the algorithms in shaping their opportunities. Okay. And a lot of, in other words, people are sort of increasingly applying for work more or less in the dark about things. Okay. It's less clear what employers want than maybe it was in. Yes, sir. Mike, go ahead. Do you know how the employers are construing what they're doing to themselves? That is, are they looking for people? You want to hire a person who, whatever, versus having to find an array of competencies and say, we're going to take stock of the competencies we have in our firm. And we're going to go out there and look for individual competencies, because some of the people associated with what is called connected credentials, like it's now credential engine, talk about a market in competencies, and talk about the ability, the rationalization being not about a workforce thought about as people, but a workforce thought about as an aggregate yes, or yes. an array of competencies. Do you know anything about whether these algorithms Reflect that no, that's 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 a real good question. I'm, I'm going to try to go there in a little bit, but but I think increasingly, to sort of just jump ahead for a bit. Increasingly, I think what you're going to be seeing is, is employers trying to design or contract to have the algorithm designed less to choose individuals in terms of their own base, you know, their own skills, their own competencies, whatever, and more in team in terms of what that means to, for putting a team together. In other words, how do you select a group? more than how do you select individuals. Okay, which is really sort of a sea change too, I think, in, in, in how we think about these things. But yeah, that's, a, that's a really good point. Eric. So why do you think that job seekers used to be more sure about the signals? I understand they're unsure now. <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's not clear to me that there was a time when they had greater certitude about what employers are looking for in the interview set. Well, yeah, I think part of it is because, you know, I think there was a time when the norm was more you apply for a specific job. Okay, so in some sense you're responding to a job ad, you're responding to, or even through network, you're responding to other people you know who worked at a particular place, you've got a sense of what you know, kind of things are being sought. Um, you know, whether it's a newspaper ad, whether it's a posting, whatever, there's sort of a direct statement of what the job duties and responsibilities are. And at least implicit in that is what kind of skills are needed to do that. I think increasingly people don't don't have access to those same sorts of indicators you know you don't have access to the same you know here's what we want somebody who's dependable and is going to show up and has got five years of doing this kind of work um, all that stuff kind of gets melded into a particular index now in ways that you know the, the job seeker I don't think is able to sort of penetrate necessarily so people I've clearly not applied for a regular job in years people when they have <laughs> Apply for a job, don't know what they're applying for. Like, there's not a description of like you're gonna, you know, be a barista or we'll expect you to blah blah blah. No, I think that, yeah, I mean, it's both web. Some of it is just sort of this blanket application where you put your name out there and see what happens. Some, some of it is what you're talking about, yeah. Um, but even then, it's not, 
I think that will become clear when I talk about keywords in a few minutes, but yeah, to me, I think there is evidence that it's less, it's more opaque now than perhaps it was. It. Okay, Hal, and then here. Yes, um, as a historian, let me ask the question in a slightly different way. Um, historically, most, or many more people than most people realize, especially today, were hired as a result of their uh, inheriting their family's tradition. Mm -hmm. Firemen becoming sons of firemen becoming firemen teachers, sons becoming teachers, professors, uh, sons and daughters becoming professors. So first thing is, uh, is there really good evidence that this kind of uh, intergenerational, uh, intrafamilial tra uh, transition has diminished in some sense? And um, you know, it's easy as an academic to look at all of this kind of stuff uh, sort of abstractly. But mm -hmm. in real terms, a lot of hiring takes place through personal relationships family relationships, and I have lots of friends who, who were lawyers and judges and so forth, and their kids became those things because they were at ease in that world. When they had an interview, they did great because they spent their whole lives hanging out with judges and lawyers. So that's my question today. Yeah, it's, it's but even then, the, the, the occupation isn't transmitted directly. It's still transmitted. You, you still have to do things to earn it, right? You still have to, and, and, and granted, it's, I mean, you look at the, the number of people who are entrepreneurs, whose parents are entrepreneurs, and it's overwhelming, no question. And professors' kids tend to become, you know, professors, perhaps. Um, but, yeah, I'm not sure, I don't want to answer this. I think probably the barriers to that happening directly are probably getting higher. And I'm not sure if I've seen sort of the intergenerational, you know, mobility tables that demonstrate that one way or another, but my guess is the barriers are probably more severe than they, they have been in the past. Okay, here and then, then Ben. I just wanted a clarification based on what Eric asked. So like, when they get to the interview with Maya or, the, or similar algorithm, is it, in, is it in reference to a particular job or they just, is this an interview that gets applied to a lot of different it can go either way. I mean, sometimes okay. sometimes one particular company is sort of contracted with Maya or whatever, but there's also it kind of goes the other direction too, where Maya has contracted with a number of different companies that are also looking for to fill different kinds of positions. So yeah, it's, it's absolutely both. I mean, it's, it's just much more sort of amorphous, I think, perhaps. So if you were looking for retail, you you might just get a lot of general questions and not know why, you know, whether or that's not that's right, okay. right, right. Ben, and then over here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I wanted to ask a, a related question. I, I, I agree with you that this sounds kind of creepy and science fiction-like and, uh, and, and offers many opportunities for reviews. But I have to admit that uh, when we started talking about Maya and these other bots, uh, I thought, wow, you know, at last, a system that can at least eliminate some racial Absolutely. Yeah. gender discrimination, you know, because it's a robot, but, but you don't really know what's going on inside. And, and the programmer could have transmitted this into the algorithm or, or not, but, but uh, well, what have you learned about that? that no, that, that's a real good point. I mean, there, there are algorithms that have been produced in ways that absolutely reduce sort of ascriptive characteristics in hiring. That will sort of, if not eliminate, they'll at least lessen the chances that you know, minorities are discriminated against or women are discriminated against. Um, it all depends on how the algorithm is written. There are also algorithms, like you know, credit reports are algorithmically generated. But the way they've been sort of written and used in the past really does discriminate against minorities. Because one of the big things there is residence. So if, if you're a, a credit worthy person who lives in an area where you know, credit is not, you know, there are fewer credit worthy people, you're gonna be penalized because of the algorithm. Okay, so the, in that case, you know, there's sort of a discriminatory, discriminatory part of the algorithm. It, you know, it depends on how they're written, but the thing is they're also sort of closely guarded by companies that, you know, Nobody knows. I mean, Amazon's not going to let you know how they sort of decide what books you should read next. So, yeah. Over here and then here. Okay. Um, so I, I just kind of wanted to jump in and mention, um, so there is a bunch of research about the intergenerational transmission of human capital that you might be interested in looking at that finds that actually um, it has become more stable over time. So it's actually uh, more and more the case that um, if you were middle class, that your children will be middle class mm -hmm. than it mm -hmm. was in the more recent past. And so, like, there's a paper 
by Raj Chetty, but also ones that held up actually geographically distributed across the United States. Um, but what's also interesting about a lot of this work is that it shows that um, there is actually less of a chance that um, you will do the same job as your parents. And so there is kind of, this has been interesting to economists because it's created this massive labor sorting problem which these algorithms are seeking to solve. And so I was wondering if, um, if you've done any work to kind of characterize the types of jobs that are using these types of algorithms and also like kind of what social class the jobs are really targeted for. Because this really seems to me like something the tech sector would do. And maybe something less that a barista would be like sort of using to apply right. to jobs at Starbucks. Because, you know, in, in the one case it's like really, it's really obvious, you know, where you're gonna get hired if you're a barista, whereas in the other case, you know, if you have general programming skills and you want a tech job that pays you well, you might be less invested in a particular kind of company that right, sure, sure. might hire you. Yeah, I, I guess the best answer I give you is those are great questions that nobody has really figured out yet. Um, but I would say that sort of the application of this rationalized hiring cuts across all sorts of different jobs that you might not expect. I mean, places like retail or, you know, like warehousing, things like that, they, they love this stuff. Because um, you can, you know, it's easy to kind of get a lot of people, you get a lot of applications, you want a quick and easy way to get rid of a bunch of them. And it's sort of a legitimate way to do that. Um, you know, sort of the upper end, I think, even now, I think hiring at the upper end, you, like, you look at Lauren Rivera's stuff, it's still really casual. You know, they could pretty much do whatever they feel like doing and, and get away with it, okay, without having to resort to all this kind of stuff. Um, but there are, there are also, like you say, some pretty skilled professional jobs that are being more and more subjected to this kind of thing. But that's all really, I mean, that's all just got to be sorted out. Yeah. Yeah, but the specialization versus generalization, it seems like this kind of a process favors the specialist and disfavors the generalist. I, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about it, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, no, I hadn't really put in those terms, but I think that makes a lot of sense. So in that last comment that you meant, to sort of tap into that. Mm -hmm. know, maybe maybe uh, hiring uh, a lot of worker bees, you know, this may make some sense, but <coughs> at, at the higher levels, you may want to pick and choose people that you're comfortable with. Yeah, re exactly, exactly. That's a good point, good point. Okay. But remember, when you say that this is used more for screening out that if you're still in the queue, they'll be talking to you more directly. Mm -hmm. Nobody's being hired through this. They're being dishired. Uh, one that's uh, no it, typically I mean you, if you kind of think of the whole hiring thing as a funnel you know where you start off with you know, lots of people here and then you do interviews and it's narrower and on and on and on just say the algorithm is getting farther down the funnel all the time and actually even past the point of hiring I mean in terms of how workplaces are organized and how you know how careers develop and all those sorts of things are increasingly subject to these sorts of processes too okay um, okay where Okay, again, so that. Um, so the, the question, and, and again, this is, you know, so what do, what do workers do or what do job seekers do in response to all this sort of thing? And in other words, how do they, how do they negotiate what gets called applicant tracking software, okay, which again, is just this whole system that employers use to, you know, to keep track of applications and such things. Um, well, basically, the answer to that is kind of the answer for employees or job seekers who are to my mind, increasingly disadvantaged in the labor market, is a sort of drawn LMIs, or labor market intermediaries, of their own. Um, what you've got are programs like Wordle and Tag Crowd and The Muse, uh, which I, I love that. You know, my, my son used to drum in a punk band, and you could see on the poster from the shows he used to give, you know, Tonight featuring Wordle, Tag Crowd, and The Muse, that, you know. Um, so it's, it's a lot like that. Um, but what these companies are in, you know, companies, applications, whatever, are in business to do now is basically help job seekers optimize their resumes, you know, you know, get their resumes in shape to look for the keywords that, you know, the algorithms are apparently seeking. Okay, this is called resume optimization. And the, the, term, the, the alphabet soup gets thicker from here on, okay? So again, there's this whole sort of addition to this whole field, kind of this whole infrastructure, this sub-layer here, who's trying to help job seekers figure out what these algorithms are looking for, okay? It, to, a sense, to an extent to which sort of the ability to master keywords is becoming almost this post-labor market, or post-IT you know, 
IML, post interlabor market era skill. Okay, it might be better to know what they're looking for than it is to know how to weld, okay? It's really become a very important sort of skill. Um, a couple other examples here. This is, I forget the company that I took this from, but this is, they're trying to give advice here to job seekers, okay? Trying to give advice to people looking for work. Um, it's called resume and cover letter action verbs. So what they tell people is in addition to listing keywords specific to your occupation, like software or sales skills, include action words that show what you've accomplished rather than just stating a list of duties, include action keywords in your position descriptions. And they go and they give you keywords, A through, well, I guess, it, I guess zoomed and zips don't help, but you know, it should be A through Z, all right? But they give you like a ton of these words that you should put in, they recommend you put in your online application. Um, I'll talk a bit more about the, what that means in a second, but again, there's this whole set of sort of things that they're suggesting job seekers do. This is one of my favorites too. This is you know, actual advice on the company webpage about how job seekers might approach the, the job hunt, the job search. They say some screening systems assign higher scores to elite schools. You may not have gotten your BA from a top tier university, but if you attended a continuing education class at one, include such qualifications on your resume. In other words, if you, you didn't go to Yale, but you went to the Yale Summer Institute of uh, you know, mountain climbing, put that on there and maybe putting the term Yale will fool them. Okay, so there's this whole sort of system telling people how to game the system. Okay, um, it's kind of like, you know, again, the example I use there is if you watch a catcher who's really good to kind of, you know, in a baseball game, but kind of move the, the mid around and make the umpire think a ball is actually a strike. Okay, so that sort of thing too. Okay. Um, you okay? <laughs> okay. Um, now, I suppose it's technically, you know, clearly it's deceptive, you know, clearly it's misleading. It's probably not illegal. All right. I mean, you did go to the Yale School of whatever. Um, what happens then is you really get this whole sort of arms race taking place. You know, as, as job seekers do that sort of thing, as they go for the resume optimization, you get the counterattack then from employers, okay? So you get things like search engine optimization or SEO. What this is, is companies then hire yet more labor marketing intermediaries so they can tailor their keywords to be picked up by other labor market intermediaries. So in other words, companies are trying to fill positions, you know, want to know what keywords are going to be latched on to get the kind of people they want, so they sort of you know, hire another company, contract with another company, produce those keywords for them. Um, so it's back and forth like that. Now, if this is productive labor, if this produces a more sort of you know, efficient labor market, you know, I don't know. It sure seems to me like a lot, a lot of dollars, billions of dollars being channeled into things that really don't necessarily put job seekers and employers together in the best, you know, most efficient way. Um, I talked then about other companies like this, you know, Galvanize and E-Intern and Credly and some others who are basically just doing the same thing. It's kind of just yet another layer, you know, when employers respond with another set of labor marketing intermediaries of their own job seekers counter, and it goes back and forth like that. Um, Handshake is one of the more popular, I don't know if you have that here or not, but Handshake is designed to link employers and college career centers and students. Um, they recently got in a lot of trouble because they had students, you know, thousands of students who had no idea in the world that their personal information was being reported on Handshake. Um, you know, their grades and all sorts of things, test scores were being reported that, you know, that nobody had ever asked them for this, okay? But all of a sudden they find that their profiles are online in ways they never anticipated. Now, the, now the, the interesting thing I think about all of this is nobody's ever really checked up to see if it works. Okay, you got companies telling, you know, or LMIs telling companies what to do. You got them telling job seekers what to do. Nobody has ever actually demonstrated that this actually does result in better outcomes. You know, if the, you know, using these kind of keywords or you know, learn how what keywords to use. If any of that really does put people in a more advantageous labor market position. Okay, I mean, it's like you know, if you look at the, I've spent a lot of time looking at the job training literature, and it's always amazed me that employers spend a lot of money on providing training for their, for their employees, you know, this and that and everything else, but they never go back and check to see if it actually made any difference. You know, the people that we provided training to, and we're finding now too, you know, a lot of the diversity training that's been offered, apparently there's reports out now that that really has done nothing to sort of you know, reduce sexual harassment or anything else. But I think most job training is like that. You really don't know. Um, I think it's a very similar sort of thing here. You got all this money, all this time, all this effort, you know, all this you know, pixels, being invested in this whole job matching operation and nobody's really checked to see if it's resulting in better outcomes. Um, 
And, and again, you know, the example I give there is, is like IQ. You know, we, we sort of for a long time thought about IQ as what IQ tests measure. And it, in a sense, we're sort of at the same place with these algorithmically generated indexes. What they are is what they measure. Okay, I mean, if they actually sort of signify something real, you know, people don't seem to find that as quite a, an interesting question. Okay, how are we doing? We're okay. Um, so, anyway, two big questions then, I guess, is to kind of you know do something with all of this because you know at heart I really do care about sort of the empirical part of all this. Um, so kind of a demand side question is how does the rationalization of hiring affect the recruitment and selection processes or practices of employers? And on the supply side, how does the rationalization of hiring affect the search behaviors of workers? And what do we know? I think, well, again, as I've been trying to indicate, we don't know an awful lot. Okay, this stuff is still sort of emerging, it's still sort of developing, it's in, and frankly, a lot of what I've talked about is stuff that's really on the horizon as much as it is stuff that's kind of permeated where we are now. Um, so we don't have the research base we're going to need, but the stressing amount of what we think we know is, comes through industry reports of what's going on. They all make these great extravagant claims about, you know, here's how we help workers find jobs, here's how we help jobs find workers. Nobody knows. I mean, they're kind of not reliable necessarily in the claims they're making for themselves. Um, okay, again, the question is how do we find out? You know, how do we build a research design that would, you know, sort of get us there? And that's kind of what I'm trying to think about now. Um, but I would say that I think we're in something of a crisis in collecting data on hiring behavior. Okay, I think for a lot of reasons, it's getting more and more difficult all the time. And you know, Matt and I talked about this this morning too, is it's getting more difficult to collect data on how hiring decisions would take place. You know, for a long time, you know, in the state's attainment work and everything else, we were sort of content to look at distributions of workers or job incumbents and look at their education and things like that and kind of infer the processes that got them there. Um, you know, after a while, we figured that that probably wasn't enough. We really needed to sort of talk to employers and see why employers made the decisions they did. And you know, I did some of that, and Jim Rosenbaum did some of that, and Chris Tilley and some other, a lot of other people. And that's good stuff, but I think it's getting harder and harder to do that kind of work where you can talk to employers directly and get the kind of information you need. And part of it is that employers, and by employers I mean both you know, human resources managers and hiring managers, have sort of seeded those decisions to the algorithm not altogether bad. Um, it does make it more difficult though to study why employers are doing what they're doing okay, when much of the discretion no longer is theirs. Also as we talked about too a little bit the, the labor market or the, labor, the, the intermediaries themselves are protective and secretive about their own algorithms. Okay, it's very sort of closely held information. You don't quite know and there's no way to know sort of what's in the black box of those programs. Um, and also and this is sort of you know, I guess my own sense, but it's kind of also the sense of people who are doing this kind of work, is employers are less likely all the time to let us in the door. I, I think sociologists in general are having a harder time getting access to employers than they were a few years ago. And for a lot of reasons, I think they're just, you know, they're just sort of closing down. Part of that, I think, is human resources managers are feeling under the gun. Okay, you know, that, you know, they're, you know, if you think about this stuff, it really does threaten their livelihood in some ways. It's taking away a lot of their own discretion, a lot of their own autonomy. And I think they're less likely to talk to outsiders than perhaps was the case at one point. Um, we've thought of other very creative ways to talk to employers. We've done a lot of audit studies and field experiments, things like that. And these things are great. And, you know, Deva Pager and, you know, Valentina DeSaccio and all sorts of folks have done really, really good work here. And I, I love this stuff. But at the end of the day, it's not real hiring decisions. I mean, they're sort of contrived scenario vignette sort of things. And that's good, and I'm willing to believe it. But it really doesn't let you get at what's actually taking place in the real world, all right? Which is where I think you know, we need to go. Um, we're starting to get some good stuff. You know, a fellow named Ming Lung and some others are doing some work where they're looking at sort of huge, and by huge I mean gazillion you know, sample size. Um, samples of job postings from LinkedIn and Monster.com and things like that. You know, if those companies are willing to sort of open these up to you, you get these enormous databases and kind of see what you know, what kind of decisions are being based, or being made on, on that data. Um, but for the most part, I think we still, as sociologists, don't know an awful lot about how to do that sort of work. You know, I think we just don't have kind of the, we haven't thought through the methodological tools at this point. Um, again, I'm designing a project now where I've got both an employer survey asking them about this kind of stuff, and a job seeker survey where I ask about this kind of stuff. My fear is I'm asking them, or I'm in danger of asking them more than they know for the reasons we just talked about, that they really don't know what's being sought, they don't know necessarily what criteria they're you know, looking for themselves. Um, so there's kind of that fear that even though I can talk to employers, I can talk to, or by you know, survey or whatever, 
talk to job seekers, talk to employers. It's not clear they're in a position to sort of give the answers that are really being, you know, at, at stake here. Um, like most of you, you know, I always tell my own students that, you know, you have to sort of let the research question determine the method you choose, the, the method is sort of secondary, what the research question does. And it really sort of alarms me a lot that that kind of takes you to, in this case, to Foucault. And I'm, you know, because of my own skill set, I'm not going there. Um, but it is, I mean, it does raise these sort of, you know, surveillance issues and, you know, panopticon issues and all these sorts of things that, you know, sort of a, a really intellectually honest approach to this stuff might kind of take you in that, in that direction, but I'm not going to want to do it. Um, it also, I think, you know, in any study that we have about these kind of things, really is going to demand that we think harder in different ways about networks. You know, we've known for a long time that social networks have a lot, and you know, Hal talked about this too a bit. Yeah, the social networks have a lot to do with who gets hired and who doesn't. You know, being connected to the right people and having family connections and friends and you know, all that kind of stuff. But I think the mark we need to draw on might be different. You know, for a long time it was Mark Granovetter, you know, where we talked about, you know, loose ties and strong ties and it's great stuff. But increasingly it's, it's, it's Mark Zuckerberg, okay, it's so he's kind of huge selection your samples of data, samples of networks, most of whom are people you don't know, that you never actually, you know, met, but you're linked into them. I, I, you're all, I'm sure, getting these ridiculous LinkedIn things all the time that, you know, people you don't know, but they want to be friends with you or whatever. Um, so those sort of networks, I think we have to find the different ways to, to make sense out of. Um, and just, you know, the last point there is that any, sort of large scale plan to solve these sorts of problems. It's going to take, it's going to be resource intensive, okay? Um, okay, I think what I'm going to do is try to get back to a question Michael asked a while ago. You know, the talk I sort of seduced you here with had something about the word coffee shops in the title. Yes, sure, because that's a segue, so yeah. yeah. Before you shift, uh, your two questions that you listed before were um, really from within the accepted the problematic of does it work, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think if John Meyer and other neo-institutionalists were here, they might say, um, well, we shouldn't be surprised that they haven't looked too closely. Oh, absolutely, yeah, this yeah. Is another example of a set of categories and ways of believing and acting it, that yep. are decoupled from uh, well, actually, I mean, they're, it's, yeah. it's really interesting because they're not being coupled. They're, they're entwined, yes. Yeah. are utterly intertwined, and yet it's still mythology at work. Yeah, I mean, as long as we don't look too close. Yeah, the whole thing, yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good point. Good point. Uh, so you, you're still talking a lot, I think, from the employer side of okay. a bunch of people and you're funneling them down, which makes sense. But on the applicant side, doesn't this technology vastly increase the option set for them? That is, That's, it's quick. It's like you know an electronic common application without beeps, right? They yeah. click. Mm -hmm. They apply to all, like you know many more jobs than back when we were kids and maybe we had a resume and would mail it. Right. 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 Um, does that change? No, that, 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 that's, that's a question I've really been struggling with a lot. It's a good one because on the one hand, sort of the argument I've been making here is that job seekers are increasingly less powerful than employers are in all this. You know, they don't know what's being looked for. You know, they don't know what the, you know, what the signals they should be sending are and everything else. But on the other hand, the unemployment rate is tiny right now. I mean, these people are getting jobs. I mean, one way or the other, even though the odds might, the, you know, things might be stacked against them, they are working for the most part. Um, so it, it may be that the trade-off you're getting from, like you say, opening up many, many more opportunities might be worth access to these opportunities being less, less clear and less transparent all the time. So yeah, it may well be that this stuff is working in, in job seekers' favor in many ways. But yeah, that's, yeah, go ahead. And then over here. Um, a lot of this seems like it was, um, like a forebearer to it and a parallel to it is uh, like online dating programs where that's you know, a survey that gives you a personality profile, you have certain credentials, it sorts you on, do you have a college degree? Some of the things are exactly the same things as an employer would look at. So I'm wondering, like, I mean, are, are you seeing these parallels? Is there research that's gone on? And I, know, I know a lot of research has been done on kind of how effective these online dating mm -hmm. profile things are at matching two people together. Um, I mean, is, is there a method there? 
understanding yeah. whether these things are effective that might tell us something about whether this could work for employers? You know, you know, actually, that's, 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 that's a much better question than you even think it is, okay? Because you really, what, what got me thinking about a lot of this stuff in the first place was talking to a colleague of mine who's in, in Germany who's doing work on online dating. You know, and it struck both of us right away that the sort of the correspondence between the two is just really spot on. I mean, they're really asking, I mean, it's kind of two-sided matching questions, you know, that we really sort of, you know, there's a lot of similarity, absolutely, between those sorts of processes and ones that are in play here. I think those two literatures, you know, and again, I'll admit I haven't really sort of delved into that literature enough yet, but there's no question that online dating literature is directly applicable to all this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's good, yeah. Yeah, a lot of the uh, job seeking uh, manuals or advice and stuff like that will tell you to, to, to bypass all this stuff and just schedule talks with people in your industry or whatever. You get to meet a lot of interesting people and, mm -hmm. and uh, spend 15, 20 minutes with them and so forth. Uh, and, and maybe that will lead you to a job better than uh, dealing with some system that's going to screen out. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure that's good advice. What do you think of that? I'm not, I think if you could do it, great, but my, my guess is it's going to be harder and harder to do that. I mean, employers, you know, if they're trying to figure out how to sort through dozens and dozens of hundreds of applications, I think walk-ons, I think, are much less of a chance than they used to. And, and you know, they're, they're accountable, too. I mean, part of the reason they do this stuff is because it, it sort of removes any accountable for sort of, you know, employment discrimination or something. If they can show that everybody's been treated equally, if you allow walk-ins, you compromise that. So yeah, I think more and more employers are going to be less likely to permit that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah another one of the parallels we can explore, of course, is Moneyball, uh, which has worked to make baseball better. All the teams are using it now. Uh, Michael Lewis's book is a, is, a, is a good read. Of course, the movie on one of those lines. And I was talking to F. King Alexander, not because I know anybody, but he was talking down the hallway. A lot of you were at that uh, meeting, too. Um, the LSU uh, chancellor, and he said that we're, we're next, folks, and if it hasn't happened already, the data analytics are ranking us uh, in terms of our publications and uh, breakbybrofessor.com scores and all of that. Uh, and people already are getting uh, you know, interesting emails, authors, and all of that, if we, we have enough publications along those lines. So we're, we, you know, data analytics are floating into that area. And F. King Alexander would like to see it happen more because it at least will, will provide some fairness in the kind of sorting out that is, uh, mm -hmm. is inevitable in our, our ranks. Yeah, you know, actually, I, I think it's even worse than you suggest, okay? There, there, <laughs> there, there is actually a program written now. There's an app that actually exists. As far as I know, it hasn't been applied yet. But you can attach it to professors' PCs. You can count over the course of a day how many minutes they spend responding to students' emails, you know, how many minutes they spend working on a particular grant, you know, how much time they spend doing, you know, and you can get that down to the, I mean, it's like, utter surveillance of you know, what we've always thought of as very highly skilled work. So yeah, I mean, the, the software exists. I don't know if it's been used, but it does, it does exist. Yeah? So I, I just have kind of a clarification question about this stuff. Are companies feeding data back to these algorithms about the performance of the work that they hire or whether the work is steady? Because uh, for the data, these examples, they have an outcome that they can model, right? But I, I guess maybe I miss or I know they're black boxes, so we don't know, but mm -hmm. they, they have outcomes that they yeah. Sometimes, yeah. I mean, they they release that data to the extent that it shows that the algorithms lead to better hiring decisions. Okay, and but that's what you tend to see. I mean, my guess is that the, most of the time they don't bother doing that because they don't. There's not much incentive for them to do that. Um, but yeah, it, but it, it is clear too that the algorithms do seem to produce, you know, pretty, you know, successful outcomes for the most part. Okay. Yeah. Performance on the job, how long they stay, um, what kind of, you know, if they make, if, if they move up the ladder over time, um, you know, any number of performance measures. Yeah. Are they doing better now on measuring job performance than 40 years ago when people were using supervisors' ratings as an outcome? It, yes, yes. Um, there are retailers who have the ability to sort of put, you know, cameras everywhere and everything on individual people selling on the shop floor, you know, selling on the storefront, um, you know, whatever. And 
counting how many times they make eye contact with customers, um, how many of those eye contacts turn into sales. Um, yeah, <laughs> no, they can measure distressingly well, I think. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, again, just, and I'll probably close here very soon with this, but again, the, the coffee, where the, I'm not gonna tell you the whole thing, but the paper I was going to talk about and decided not to and where the coffee shop thing comes from is a paper I wrote recently on sort of the relationship between education and economic development, all right? And the argument I make there is that you have to think about education related to economic development at different levels that are sort of nested, like an individual level and then a workplace level, um, regional level and the national level. And the argument I make is that sociologists have the most to contribute really at the two middle levels, okay, workplaces, and regions. Um, so, but coffee shops is sort of response to the fact that, you know, when you talk about regional effects, you know, education is affected at a regional level. Every university in the world lies. You know, they talk about, they have these educational, or these economic impact statements where they say that, you know, for every dollar you invest here, we return seven, which is just absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it's nuts. Um, and it sort of makes the assumption that nobody else in the area is making any contribution to economic development, including things like coffee shops, okay? So we're gonna talk about more of that in the paper, but that's kind of where it comes from. Um, but more directly, you know, it's in terms of sort of this, you know, rationalization. You know, I think the rationalization of hiring is only one piece of the rationalization of the whole employment relationship. Okay, and we've kind of been moving in that direction now too. That, you know, more and more of the workplace is being, and it's kind of digital tailorism almost, you know, you might think of. Um, and the irony, it seems to me, in some ways, is that employer, if you ask employers what they want, and you know, Matt has done a lot of this stuff, and you know, I did some of this stuff, you ask employers what they want, and they always say teamwork. We want people who can work in teams. But still, ultimately, at the end of the day, they hire individuals, okay, you know, clearly. Um, but there is evidence that that's sort of changing now, that there are algorithms that will pr you know, permit managers to assemble teams rather than just sem assemble individuals certain skills. There's a guy named Sandy Pentland at MIT who has got these you know, really creative, if a little frightening studies that he does where he puts little electronic badges on people, um, you know, groups of people, and he has them solve certain sorts of problems. And it, it, this generates literally hundreds of thousands of points of, of data. I mean, just because you know, they're there for quite a length of time and everything they do, I mean, eye contact, body movements, everything, is just you know, measured down to the finest detail. But what he finds is that you can make pretty good predictions by sort of combing through all these data about how well teams perform and how well people with certain sort of characteristics contribute to that team effort, okay? And, and it's, it's remarkable stuff. I mean, he's clearly, and he's, he started a, you know, a startup, by the way, now too. He'll, you know, he's in business. Um, but, the, but the point is that there may be ways in which you know, algorithms can lead to sort of a different basis of hiring in the future than they are now, that they can be used as a basis for sort of, you know, putting teams together in some interesting ways of scary ways, rather than just individuals, okay? And particularly since more and more work is sort of short-term work, you know, it's project-based rather than kind of employer-based over time, you really can see this sort of thing becoming more and more popular, it seems to me. Um, so you know, in a way, kind of the sort of the basic language the labor market sociologists have used, you know, safe attainment, school to work, things like that, you know, we might need to sort of shift our attention a bit to more like, you know, peer effects, and we know a lot about peer effects in schools. We know a lot less about peer effects in workplaces, I think. Um, you know, networks, informal interactions, all those sorts of things might become more and more important as, as determinants of individual opportunity at the end of the day, okay? Um, it's, I go on then to say some things about the workplace level, why this might matter. I'm not sure if I need to talk about this now, but, but just to demonstrate that, you know, there are workplace sorts of interactions that are, you know, sort of emergent from individual sorts of interactions, like being in a highly educated workplace Ten, highly educated workplaces tend to be more productive. Okay, in other words, workplaces that have a lot of highly schooled people tend to do the same work better than people, than workplaces with less highly schooled people. And that's not because of selection. It's not because smart people tend to graduate, or, you know, kind of gravitate toward those kind of workplaces. But there really does seem to be a causal thing going. Um, more educated workers, you know, make less educated workers around them more productive. You know, if you put less educated workers with a lot of, you know, highly skilled people, they do better themselves. For whatever, and you can think of a lot of reasons why that would be true. Lots of peer effects that might take place there. Um, now the interesting thing, it seems to me, or this kind of the potentially interesting thing down the road is that doesn't just happen. I mean, you can't put a lot of smart people in a room and expect good results unless it's managed properly. I mean, there are ways to put organizations, your know, workplaces together in ways that elicit that sort of performance. But what we're seeing is that there's some indication that maybe, those al maybe there are algorithms that can do that better than managers can do that. 
the managers may be very skilled at how do you assemble people together and get, kind of get the you know, maximum productivity out of them. But there may be ways that you can sort of design a program that will do that even more effectively. Okay? Um, okay. So again, you know, perhaps the question is something like, you know, how do employers hire workers might shift to something more like how do employers assemble teams? Okay, let me, let me just close with this then, okay? Because I kind of want to circle back to what motivated me to look at all this stuff in the first place, you know, what I've been after for years trying to figure out is what role do educational credentials play in hiring decisions? You know, why do employers look at credentials when they hire who they do? What do they think they're getting when they look at certain sorts of credentials? What kind of signals are being sent? Um, you know, for better or worse, you know, we, we being, you know, labor market sociologists have tended to equate education with merit. And I know we don't really believe that, and there's all sorts of bells and whistles, but for the most part, it's not a bad story, okay? You know, you know people who have achieved an education are probably in some sense more meritocratic or mer meritorious than other folks. And we kind of, you know, that's a story we sort of agreed on. But I also found this quote from a guy who had a company called Transcom, and I, I don't really know what Transcom does or, you know, what they, what they build or whatever. But what he says is they're shifting their focus when they fill technical support positions away from college graduates and toward what he says, kids living in their parents' basement. Um, so in other words, there's sort of a, a direct, and this is a high-tech company, a direct devaluation of educational credentials, a direct you know, rejection of educational credentials toward this more sort of idiosyncratic set of characteristics they're looking for. They really think some kid living in the parents' basement is probably gonna do this sort of work better than somebody with a master's degree in engineering, okay? Um, so I guess the, the kind of the question then, and this you know, or series of questions is, you know, what happens when an algorithmically derived number, or something else like I talk about an affinity with a particular Japanese manga web page, and that that's true. There's actually a study that shows you know, it's, this is remarkable too. But this company that kind of tracks coders all over this whole geographic area, you know, and not necessarily with the coders knowing they're doing it, but there's ways to sort of get in and it. It assesses the work performance and the online behavior of a whole series of coders, and it finds that those who, attend, who sort of regularly go back to this particular Japanese manga website, I have no idea what, I don't know anything about manga, but people who go to that website are much more effective coders than people who don't go to that website. And I don't know if, they, if it's smart people who go to that site, or if they go to that site and learn something, or nobody knows, um, but it's real. I mean, there's no question that there is that sort of correlation there anyway. Um, so if if you know that, or if you know the labor mark or the intermediary assisted ability to game the keywords or whatever, is a better indicator of merit than education is. I mean, it seems to me that's kind of a, a set of questions we might want to start you know giving a little more thought to. In the last couple of weeks, uh, young young women have discovered harassment in the workplace, sexual harassment. When do people who are online and the teens that you're talking about start discovering unions? You know, something that, uh, again, face-to-face uh, uh, -face unions, the union busters have found ways to disperse them, to penalize the people who have uh, been uh, involved. But when there are so many different channels of organization that young people have been able to encounter, uh, perhaps union busting will be more difficult. At some point, people are going to say, this, this sucks. You know, we're going to be exploited. We want to connect. We want union benefits, et cetera. And they'll discover what we've learned you know, mm -hmm. they were 20, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, I, I hope you're right. I, I, I'm probably skeptical. <laughs> um, you know, it seems to me any sort of collective action would be, it'd really be difficult to sort of generate collective action in such a dispersed system as this. You know, when people are sort of connected electronically rather than, yeah. But look at Me Too. It came up, and all of a sudden, you know, now everybody's, you know, hashtag Me Too. Yeah, that, yeah sure. Know. And that could, the same type of thing could happen, but again, uh, you know, let's let's hope the unions can emerge in a different form. Okay, good, good, good point, Eric. Do we have any idea of what percentage of vacancies get filled through this process you've outlined, or percentage of vacancies in different industries, or any even descriptive understanding of the magnitude of this sort of online screening stuff? Um, no, no. Um, I mean, you hear reports from industries, which I tend not to, I tend to discount those, you know. I mean, they, they, I think they want to really inflate that number. Um, but my guess is it's appreciable. I mean, I, it's far from insignificant, I think. Okay, and the, by any measure, too, the trend is, is upward. There's no doubt about that. Mike. I would be a little um, skeptical of overgeneralizing from 
examples like your oh absolutely Foxconn that's yeah else. Mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> the reason I'm saying this is um, and I'm going to forget the names but there there have been these articles in, in like Forbes and other places about uh, the companies no longer care about your credential they want your skill right yeah they want what you know what you can do. And then they, there's an example of a big, major, major consulting firm in the UK that said they're not going to ask for your credentials anymore. And then there's been, and, and Silicon Valley isn't going to care where you went. And the follow-up journalism on this is, yeah, there's some more hiring of people who don't have credentials, and 95% of the jobs that are being hired for in Silicon Valley or some overwhelming number remain yes. requiring a credential. Similarly, and I don't know how they derive this, but we see all the time X percentage of all the new jobs will, quote, require a college degree. Yeah. So, you know, there's a... Uh, there's an incentive for the people who are promoting this claim that it's displacing everything else. Mm -hmm. No, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Eric's question is so important. No, I, th that's absolutely true. I, mean, I think the best advice you can still give a young person is go to college. There's no question about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Hal. You won't be surprised to know that um, I was uh, curious about your comment about your German colleague and uh, dating sites and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, I would see no reason in Germany, I would see no reason in Germany why uh, the uh, fusion of this kind of technology wouldn't be equivalent to what takes place in the United States. But I would be very surprised if job seeking uh, software is nearly as diffused in Germany as it is in the United States. Can you say mm -hmm. anything about that? Because they have a good certification system. We don't. Yeah. You know, I, that, that's a good question. Yeah, Hal, I, don't, I haven't looked at that. I don't know, but that's, that's something I will check on. Because that, that is a good point. Um, you know, almost all the literature you see in this stuff is either American or British. Um, which doesn't mean it's not taking place other places. But yeah, I'd be surprised if it's been sort of as diffused in Germany as it is here for the same reasons. I mean, you don't need it. Yeah. Transcom, that's a German company. I'm sorry? Transcom is a German company. Is it? Okay. All right. I think digital batching will find is more, at least what I'm saying, is, is more uh, prevalent in um, Anglo American Australia, and, uh, UK here. And I see nothing of It's a good question. It's a good question. Eric. Yeah. Okay. In the beginning, you mentioned about uh, internal hiring versus external hiring and the growth of external hiring. And it occurs to me that um, this trend might be more pronounced in industries where the external hire, where the networks among separate employers are looser or more non existent. Mm -hmm. In other words, if I can, if it's hiring within, say, the school system, and I can call the principal of another school where you worked previously, or um, you know, where there's where there's networks and relationships among the employers, um, and where the hiring managers have more experience, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be less reliant on this. But in something like tech, where you've got a lot of companies that are founded and led, and the hiring is done by young people, where the skills that themselves are required, nobody is bound to have more than, say, three years' experience mm -hmm. because the technology is not even around that long, you might be more reliant on this. In other words, like there's going to be some industries where there's going to be more interpersonal network relationship I think that's, yeah. information available to an employer. This is filling a gap as industries, new industries develop. No, I, I think that makes sense. And, you know, even the very simple number I gave about, you know, like this, whatever, 
10% or 60% a few years ago and 10% now of hires from the outside. Even that number can be problematic in a lot of ways because more and more jobs now aren't employer jobs. So I mean, if you, you know, you put your name out there and you get a short-term project to, you know, to code for somebody, I suppose that counts as an external hire, but it's not the same sort of external hire that we're, we think about, you know. So it's, yeah, I mean, even those very basic numbers are, you know, the definitions are much slipperier than they were, I think. It's a good point, good point. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the guy, I don't know if his first name was Gary, but his last name is definitely King from Harvard. <laughs> yeah. The supposedly number one uh, PhD uh, political science uh, graduate sure. from the University of Wisconsin mm -hmm. a few months ago was talking about uh, China. And, and it struck me uh, the, the parallel with the, the, the sort of anti union bias of many modern employers, uh, he, he was uh, describing a situation where where they allow, the Chinese are, are kind of free, allowing you to think thoughts and, and cr criticize authorities and, and whatever you want to do, but just don't organize, don't meet at a, this corner or something like that, mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of people. That's what they're trying to get away from, that, but, but they welcome criticism because some is valid and sometimes you know you, you need to need some feedback but they don't want you to get organized uh, that's it interesting me, uh, that the uh, Chinese government is somewhat like uh, what many modern employers are oh, yeah. in society you know, in but, a yeah. biased type of situation mm -hmm. how does that square with their whole new social credit surveillance plan where they're going by doing all the kind of things David was talking about, dipping into various online sources that you use. They're going to aggregate uh, That's really scary. <laughs> you, your views as well as your activities into what they're calling, if I'm remembering right, it was just written up, a social credit score. And it will essentially be interpreted as a loyalty to the system um, mm -hmm. measure uh, it, it was the most draconian thing I have ever, ever, ever seen. And the reason I'm mentioning it is it goes well beyond don't get, think what you want, get together, but don't get together. It was monitoring at least the expression of thought. And that would have somehow aggregated this into a measure of how dependable you are as a citizen. Um, it was yeah. Have others seen this? Yeah, it's Foucault, Foucault again. Oh, <laughs> I'm using him. I'm going to use him in my book sometimes. Through that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've been reading. I, I've been deep into this horrible. Transition from the materiality of paper to the digital materiality. Mm -hmm. um, like with the paper resume, I mean, with the paper resume process, it's giving you some more of the person who into that. You know, like when you buy higher grade paper and you, like, you attach uh, you know, your transcript with has a C level, there's various, you, you, you give it, put a nice shirt on, and you go back the resume into the office and smile. And you say, mm -hmm.
Yeah, that, that, that's, that's good. I, I, I'll be honest, I haven't really thought about that aspect of it, but that's really, it's really an interesting set of, set of things. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I've got, yeah, go ahead. Is there a way to like, uh, Probably not. Probably not. That's, that's, that's a good question. Yeah, that's good. I'm, I'm going to think about that. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Eric. I'm sort of ripping off the comment. Thinking again about the employee side, mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me there's at least some literature in economics that suggests that part of the wage inequality, the rise in wage inequality, is driven by between firm inequality. Right, right. And it could well be that this hiring externally is in part driven by savvy employees knowing. The only way I'm going to really bump my salary is by switching. Is by firms. jumping around, yeah. The labor market doesn't really pay off that much. It's, that's very, yeah, that's, that's very possible. I'm, mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's very, I think yeah. Sort of balance is probably important to consider when you're sort of developing it more, right? Right. See, I, but your, your your impulse is to sort of think that this works more to the benefit of employees than not. No, no, it's, a mad, it's the two sides. It's just that okay. you see. Again, you see more on the employer side. I'm mm -hmm. not saying it's about it. I'm saying they're both they're both in play. Again. No, I think you're I think you're right. I probably have emphasized the employer side much more than. But no, I, yeah. I mean I absolutely agree. The employer side's key. It's not. It's, I'm not dismissing it. Right? I think there's no. probably more on the employee side. As well. Okay. No, that, that's that's good. That's good. I think there, I think it's a good question. I think nobody has any clue how many algorithms are out there, um, how widespread any given one is, um, or even how to go about finding that out. Okay, I mean they're they're everywhere. I mean you know Amazon alone has got you know just you know I don't know the number, but just you know numerous algorithms that they use. A good question. Yeah. Yeah. Like sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's very popular. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's sort of like uh, it's not more objective if your data is biased. Well, it, it's it's no more objective than the people who program them. Right. Yeah. Right. Sure. 